You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, Will. Hello, David. Hello, listeners, and welcome to a special bonus episode of the Common Descent Podcast. It's another Patreon mini-episode compilation. Woo! One of the benefits that our subscribers on Patreon can receive for subscribing at a particularly flattering level (laughs) is a mini-episode recorded by us on a subject of their choice. Yeah, their favorite animal. Favorite animal, group of animals, species, whatever you want to be. We will record a short episode of our musings and thoughts and info about that creature or creatures. They're a ton of fun. We always enjoy doing them. We enjoy having some cool thing to share with our high-level patrons. And as we've done in the past, when we rack up a number of them, we put them together into a compilation and release them so that everybody can enjoy these little conversations. We have done this twice before. This is patron mini-episode compilation number three. Trace. In this compilation, you will hear us talk about the following topics. Stegosaurs, for Sean, which we have since done an episode about. Yes. Funnily (laughs) enough. Tarantulas, for Rebecca. Dilophosaurus, for Hobart. Two different types of turtles, Matamatas and Pignose Turtles, for reasons that will become evident in the recording. Yep, yep. For Quags, Whales for Taya, and Parasaurolophus for Kristoff. A delightful group of creatures. Thank you, as always, to all of our patrons for their support, whether they be at the level to receive mini-episodes or not. And thank you, as always, to all of our listeners, be you patrons currently, in the past, or perhaps in the future. Mm Mm-hmm. Without further ado, uh, we take you away to our mini-episode recordings. We hope you enjoy. Have fun. Hello, David. Hello, Will. And hello, Sean. Welcome to your mini-episode. As one of our top tier patrons, you get to select a episode, a personalized episode about your favorite animal or group of animals, and you selected stegosaurs. A very good choice. Yeah, it's a cool group. <laughs> it's such a cool group of animals. So, Sean already knows this, but of course the stegosaurs are the group of dinosaurs typified by stegosaurus. Yep. With their st- plates and spikes all over their body often on their tail yeah this this really ornamental body armor well there's and they're such an interesting group because stegosaurs are are, are one of those weird dinosaur groups where they're so famous yes that they almost seem ordinary yeah like they're they're everywhere stegosaur it's one of stegosaurus is like one of the four or five classic dinosaur shapes like if you get dinosaur gummies or something one of the shapes will be a stegosaurus yep absolutely it's just one of the iconic recognizable dinosaur shapes stegosaurus itself is one of the most one of the original famous dinosaurs yes exactly like one of the ones that made dinosaurs popular yes back in the late eight uh, the late 1800s 1880s or 70s or so stegosaurus was first named and it they're so common like Triceratops mm-hmm. and like uh, the generic ideal of a sauropod, which is often called Brontosaurus, <laughs> that it's easy to think of them as old news. Yeah. But they're not. They're so cool. Oh, yeah. We still so don't understand what they're doing with their bizarre bodies. And we keep learning more new stuff about stegosaurs. Well, I think one of the things that gets me with them is, like I said, we treat them very much like their old hat, you know, or at least, you know, publicly. Right. Popularly. But they are still so bizarre. Like, they have this ornamentation, body armor. Like, I I don't even know exactly what the best term for it is because we don't understand it. And it comes in so many different varieties. Yes. Like, some are flat, some are sharp, Mm -hmm. some are short. All of their plating is so different. And then you have this really crazy tail, seemingly weapon. Mm Mm-hmm. That we don't see on anything else. Like, uh, there are other things today that have club tails. Yes, like ankylosaurs. Yes. 
I can't think of anything <laughs> with just giant spikes coming out of its tail. What? So they're just so weird, but I feel like they are one of those groups uh, that if we could just get a glimpse of one actually alive behaving, it would be very easy to go, oh, <laughs> right. That's what you're, it's like if you showed someone a picture of a peacock and went, but, but that's all I'm giving you. Right. It's, all right. So what is that? That's all I'm giving you. And there's such a weird, because even something like ceratopsians, you can at least reasonably infer, okay, probably kind of like a rhino or a bison. Things with horns on their heads. We have right. those. Sort of in that realm. Something like a theropod, which we, don't, you know, like T-Rex, we don't have very much at all like that today. But you have sort of, okay, I mean, I've seen a cassowary. Yes. I can kind of, eh, there's some similarity. I have things that walk like you. And we have big predators. Right. So, I mean, I can kind of conflate those two. Yeah. Stegosaurus is such a weird animal, and all of its friends are so weird-shaped. Yeah, well, and, and you're this massive herbivore. Like, they're so big. They're huge. They're huge with this itty-bitty head. Yep, and little front arms. And, li like, little front... What? That weirdly sloping profile. Yeah. Like, I... What were you... I... I... I my inclination would be to say you've got to be super specialized or something mm -hmm. to be so weird. But there, there, are, there are so many of them. Yeah, they're all over the world. They're all over. They're everywhere, and they're all different kinds of shapes. So, like, unless you're, <laughs> unless you're all like orchids and you're all specialized, right? <laughs> <laughs> then maybe they were. <laughs> but like, they're so weird yet so common. Yeah, and that's it, it's hard to really wrap your mind around that because any group today that we could compare that to we're used to because they're alive right so there's not a group that you can easily go and be like oh yeah you know antelopes someone from another time would look at antelopes and be like ah right weird what it, what in the world and we're like no it's an antelope calm down yeah it's it's an a hard group to really appreciate because of the like the contradiction between how strange and yet how common yeah. they are well, it's always weird to look into the fossil record and find a group of animals that is utterly bizarre and yet was clearly very successful. Yeah, we're doing great. Stegosaur, the, the, that weird stegosaur body shape clearly worked. Clearly that was something that you could be and succeed uh, all around the world for many millions of years, which makes it that much weirder for us to try to figure out exactly how it worked. Yeah, because when you find, you know, one specimen or just a handful of species of a weird group, mm -hmm. you know, like Therizinosaurus, where it's like, all right, that's a weirdo. You're uh, an extreme body shape, mm -hmm. uh, but you're not a dominating, you know, so I can I can accept that. Like, all right, you got specialized in some interesting way. This is a group that so, that was a niche in the ancient ecosystem that they fit into sure although i you know uh this is a side bit i feel like therizinosaurs are also more common than at first i think they are yeah and i always think of them like ground sloths and ground sloths were also surprisingly common for how weird they were that's a good point yeah so this isn't a stegosaurus <laughs> I mean, this no. is certainly not a unique thing for stegosaurus we're constantly weirded out by things in the fossil record well, and it's, it's, uh, so hard <laughs> to, uh, fully appreciate a fossil organism when the role they're filling in the ecosystem, just that space doesn't seem to exist today. Like, or at the very least, the way they're doing it. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, the whole idea of what are Stegosaurus's plates for is one of the classic things we have argued about for over a century in paleontology because not only is it a weird shape it's got features that mm -hmm. we don't see in animals today or largely anywhere else in the fossil record yeah now i i do think that there is a very good chance it is often the case whenever we find a weird feature and we find ourselves going back and forth about what which of these totally reasonable functions do we think this had with the stegosaur plates display um thermoregulation defense maybe even as is so often the case odds are it was more than one of those things yes especially given how successful the group was 
there's a good chance you weren't just doing one thing with well, with this weird feature. Well, yeah, like it, with a diverse group like this, I feel like it's uh, especially a you know, fossil group. I feel like it's very easy to forget that today when you look at like sharks, you know, they're a, a successful, wide, diverse group, but they're not all doing the same thing. Mm-hmm. Like the whale shark, the basking shark, and the mega mouth filter feed. Yeah. No one else in that group's <laughs> filter feeding. Like the cookie cutter shark is effectively a parasitic shark. Yeah. Uh, none of the other sharks for the most part are doing so like so what you're saying is we it, time all it's only a matter of time before we find the parasitic stegosaur yes exactly that latched onto sauropod bellies yep 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 and had and used its plates as protection around the part of it that wasn't connected the barnacle stegosaur yes uh i'm on board but like yeah stegosaurus for all we know could have been one of the weird ones and that's why its plates were so big and exaggerated like it might have <laughs> been doing something that not all the others were doing with it, or it was doing more of something that mm-hmm. they were sometimes used for. Well, and Stegosaurus itself is one of those cases, like with Triceratops, like with Ankylosaurus, where the first member of the group that became really well known and thus became the famous one is also the biggest and in some respects possibly weird one. Yeah. Stegosaurus is, as far as I'm aware, the biggest of the stegosaurs mm-hmm. just like ankylosaurus is the biggest of the ankylosaurs and it's the first one we came to understand and if i have my information correct stegosaurus is also known from a surprisingly large number of specimens yeah like there are a lot we've talked about there are a lot of dinosaurs where like they're famous but you know spinosaurus is only actually known from a handful of specimens Carnotaurus is still to this day known from a single skeleton. <laughs> the Carnotaurus. The Carnotaurus. But Stegosaurus, we've got tons of specimens. And it's this group that has just expanded and diversified in our knowledge over the hundred plus years since it was discovered. Learning tons about Stegosaurus and all of the weird relatives that it had within its group. As is typical of these Patreon mini episodes, as of this recording, we have not done an episode about these animals yet. No, we haven't. We did ankylosaurs, their sisters, yep. in episode 69, but we, we are yet to have a stegosaurs episode, which will be a lot of fun. Oh, that'd be so cool. That's going to be, it's going to be like Ceratopsians in that we get to go in and say, yes, you know the famous one. Here's just the utterly bizarre diversity. Yep. Of this group of animals. Well, it's, I remember as a kid when I first discovered that there were other shaped stegosaurs. Because, mm-hmm. uh, like, I'd seen a picture of, I don't remember its name, uh, but one that had very short plates down the back. Yes. I know the one you're talking about. I don't remember yeah. the name. At least in the artistic reconstruction, still looked very much like stegosaurus, but, like, its plates hadn't come in all the way. Right. The, well, the plates kind of were shaped like Ayers Rock. Exactly. Yeah. Just little boop, boop. But then I got a toy of a Kentrosaurus. Right. <laughs> and that immediately became my favorite because it's like it's covered in spikes. Well, yeah, it's like here's Stegosaurus and that's real cool and weird, right? And then here's the sleek, sexy version that's all <laughs> spiky and the plates are all a bit more pointed and angled and it's got more spikes on the tail. And it's, all right, well, that's better, right? We can all agree. <laughs> also, if I remember correctly, Kentrosaurus is the only one known with shoulder spikes. Yes, shoulder spikes. It's got shoulder, which Ankylosaurs have, or at least something similar. Yeah. But stegosaurs generally don't. And, like, that's another one of those where not only are you widespread and diverse, but you have just crazy weird ones like that. Yeah. Where it's like, were, were there others like this? Are you just especially weird? Is there a whole branch of shoulder-spiked ones that we're missing? <laughs> oh. So someday we will discuss more about stegosaurs on the podcast. I wonder if, if there has been... Surely this exists somewhere. Uh, what dinosaurs are the most commonly represented in popular media? Oh, that yeah, that's got to be because like I top two I'd put money is T Rex yep. slash T Rex shaped things and Brontosaurus slash Brontosaurus shaped things. Yeah, but after that, Stegosaurus has got to be in like top five to ten. Yes, absolutely. I would I sure. would be willing to put a small amount of money on top five. Yeah, for same. sure. Well, I think 
one of the the at least my favorite ways to encapsulate how famous they are is when they were designing Godzilla. <laughs> they only chose two dinosaurs to base them off of, and it was a T Rex and Stegosaurus spikes. You're not wrong. Like, oh man, we saw. I don't remember who did this, uh, or or I'd say it, but I shared this with Will recently. I saw on Twitter some. I think it was a paleo artist had done a reconstruction of Godzilla as a stegosaur. Yeah. So it had like the general anatomy of a stegosaur and it was interpreted as like, yeah, Godzilla evolved among the stegosaurs. Yes. And it looked so cool. It was so awesome. <laughs> that was what might be my favorite version of a real quote, real life uh, Godzilla. Yeah. Right? Very cool. Well, thanks Sean for this suggestion. We've had a lot of fun talking about stegosaurs. We hope you have enjoyed this mini discussion as well. Absolutely. And thanks, of course, for supporting us on Patreon. We really appreciate it. Yeah, no, it means a lot. There will be more Patreon stuff in the future. There will be more episodes in the future. And someday in the in in the future, one of those episodes, surely, as long as we're getting requests for it, will be stegosaurs. Oh, Garrett, like, there's no... I'm, we've got to have a request. It's it's probably our... In oh. fact, I it is already on the yeah, list. There's I know it's no already on the way. list. <laughs> <laughs> and we are absolutely going to do an episode. Absolutely. <laughs> so stay tuned for more stuff, and we'll see you later. See you, Sean. Hello, Will. Hello, David. Hello, Rebecca. Hi. This is your patron mini episode. Because you are a top tier patron, you got to request a subject, an animal slash animal group of your choice for us to do a mini discussion about. And you chose tarantulas. Good choice. Very cool choice. And we are happy to deliver, both because of top tier patron, but also Rebecca, our Dragon Con friend. Yeah. Hey. Uh, we're so sorry we haven't gotten to see you at Dragon Con these last couple years. Yeah. Because the, the world has gone uh, r- ridiculous. But it's both been metaphorically and parts of it literally on fire. Yes, it's been it's been a time, but we're very happy to be able to uh, deliver you a mini episode discussion in return for your support and your fanness <laughs> of our podcast, Tarantulas. So oftentimes on these mini episodes, I'll uh, we will end up saying something like, "Yeah, we haven't done an episode about this topic yet." But as of this recording, that's not really true. Yeah. We, we did a spiders episode. We've gone through spiders, so we didn't focus on tarantulas. That's, and in fact, they didn't really get mentioned very much. Uh, I mentioned what group they were in and a couple of the things about them. They came up a few times. But yeah, we didn't really get to go into them, right. which is partially because, A, it's uh, spiders. Right. Spiders are a big group. But also, they are not one of the big groups of spiders. No, they are not the typical spider. No, they are very, still very diverse. Uh, like, oh, yeah. There's lots of kinds of tarantulas, and they they are by no means like a dwindling, you know, poor performing group, but they are not orb weavers. <laughs> right. <laughs> They're not jumping spiders. Yeah. Tarantulas are a very cool group. I think the thing that is weirdest and most wondrous to me about tarantulas is that when you think so spiders as a concept you know spiders spiders are dangerous and they're they're intensely predatory and they are creepy by our human standards Mm -hmm. and tarantulas are like if you took a spider and made it worse it's like (laughs) tarantulas look like what you would get if you asked a movie maker so hey could you make the ideal monster movie spider. Right. You would it, get a tarantula. It's a spider, but it's thicker and it's covered in hair. So it looks it kind of reminiscent of like a mangy wolf or something. Well, they, also, the hairs are deadly. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> the, and they have this ominous plodding walk. Yeah. Yeah. That, that slow sort yeah. of creeping walk. It, it Tarantulas feel like you took a group of animals that people, human beings are generally already uncomfortable with and made the creepy Halloween version of it. And when I think about that, the last thing that I think is pet. Right? It's so weird that tarantulas are like really common pets. 
But man, once you get to hold a tarantula, they're so endearing. <laughs> yeah. I don't think I've ever gotten, I've never gotten to hold a tarantula. So when I was living with our friend Ashley, mm -hmm. uh, Ashley has had, I don't know if they still have this tarantula. It's been a number of years. I don't know how long tarantulas last. <laughs> but for a while, they had a pet tarantula, but it didn't come out. Yeah. You know, they fed it in the thing and they didn't really, they, they, they didn't move it very much because it's a tarantula. Yeah. We had at the aquarium a, uh, let's see if I can remember which kind, a Chilean rose-haired tarantula. Okay. Those, I have heard that name because those are supposedly, I think, one of the common, easy pet tarantulas. Yeah, they're, they're a very common pet tarantula. Uh, and they're, you know, moderate size. Like, for most adult palms, her legs would have reached from one edge of my palm to the other, not getting onto the fingers. Right. So it was very easy to hold her in a hand. Okay. Uh, but, like, they, once... You got used to handling her. And once you got her in her your hands, and she was handled quite often, so she was very comfortable in the hands, you could just very easily do the hand treadmill where you let her mm -hmm. walk from one hand to the next and just replace your previous hand in front. Uh, and it's just that slow walk is just a careful walk. Like, that's why they walk slow. Right. They're not actually, like menacing yeah they're not in their head being like dun 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 well it's like the uh i don't know if you rebecca have ever seen this movie but the movie behind the mask yes yes the story of leslie vernon <laughs> yeah. where he talks about how if you want to be a good uh slasher in a in a horror situation you have to be really good at running in the brief moments between when your victim turns around to look at you and you have to walk menacingly. You have to master the slow walk. Yep. <laughs> but yeah, it's a careful walk. And once you get used to that, you immediately feel how they, it's gentle. It's just these gentle, yeah. tentative steps. And I don't know, for me, that immediately endeared me to her. Of She's just taking these little baby steps, these little careful tiptoes off over my hands. And I immediately became very protective of like, oh, no, I don't want to make you nervous. And I don't want you to feel like you're going to fall. Yeah. Well, they're also really fragile, aren't they? Yeah. Uh, the way I've heard it described is if you were to like just holding one at chest height, drop them onto the floor, they will effectively shatter. That's what I've heard, too. Like they crack because their exoskeleton is big and tough, but it's not flexible. Right. So it can't take impacts. Right. Not a real impact. No. Which is why they're mostly terrestrial on the ground right they and when they in trees yeah, and when they do climb it's very very careful slow and careful yeah i know that there are some and i don't know how common this is among them but i know there are at least a couple of tarantulas that have uh uh spinnerets on their feet to make huh little web attaching footholds for them to climb out of hard uh you know uh, low traction areas where they're having trouble getting a grip Oh, cool. Uh, like I said, I don't know how common that is. I know, it, and it might, maybe it's not tarantulas, maybe it's another ground-dwelling spider. Mm -hmm. So I'd have to actually double-check that, but I'm pretty sure it's a tarantula. Um, and it's because of, yeah, if they fall, that's it. Uh, they can't do the safety line like other spiders because they don't have that kind of cement-attached silk. Okay. Uh, which, uh, uh, we I can't remember, the, there's a name for that glue but it's that glue that lets the spider just go boop and now i am tethered to this spot right they can't do that uh that their silk is much more in sheets they don't do strands gotcha. you know lines like other spider like the orb weavers can that's the orb re weaver silk spinning technique uh so yeah they can't throw a safety line when they're climbing a tree and even if they could it have to be a heavy duty safety line right for a hefty spider These big spiders well tarantulas aren't at least some species of tarantulas are among the largest spiders oh yeah like the heaviest spider is a tarantula it's the goliath birding that's, spider that's what i thought that's that, what i was thinking that is a in the tarantula group uh which brings up another thing about tarantulas is that tarantulas fit into this category of terrestrial invertebrates that feed on vertebrates yeah which is a thing that I think we can all agree should just not exist. <laughs> that is, that's too much. You got to cut that out. I, I know that tarantulas have been cited as eating birds, like the Goliath bird eater, mm -hmm. uh, small mammals like mice and stuff, lizards, and 
most horrif- horrifically of all, snakes. <laughs> I've seen videos of snakes caught in spider webs. Uh, I don't know if I've ever seen one specifically that was a tarantula. I feel like I've seen one. I know I've I just, seen one I just don't lizard. know if I have seen a tarantula off the top of my head. Yeah, I, I know I've seen a tarantula with lizard, like a picture. I feel like I've seen a snake, but I, I, I know I've seen a centipede taking out a snake, so maybe that's what I'm thinking of. I have seen spiders take out, or at least have snakes in their webs. Yes. Uh, they may or may not have actually killed the snake. Yeah. Uh, it may have just gotten caught there. But yeah, tarantulas, I believe, have been documented at least eating snakes. It would surprise me if they hadn't. Well, especially the little, like, worm snakes, yeah, which exactly. are basically worm-sized. Mm-hmm. That's relatively easy prey if you're a giant monster spider. Well, and even, like, longer snakes, a snake is still a fairly small body when you actually take the full mass yes. into it. So a good tarantula bite could still take down a, you know, not l- super long, you know, not 5, 10 feet, you yeah. know, but, like, decent size a snake. garter snake would absolutely probably be small enough body weight size uh, to, to suffer some ill effects. Exactly. Uh, well, and that's other, also one of the neat things with tarantulas is because they're taking down bigger prey, uh, and uh, maybe not because, but they have a different set of fangs than what you typically think of as spider fangs. Oh, yeah. You know, most like black widows and other orb weaver spiders have that pincer mouth, fangs that face toward one another and bite in right. toward each other in a pincer. Like mandible. Pinching, like, like, yes. Your classic... Sort of monster mandible. Yeah, ant the, mouth. Yeah, ant mouth. Thank you. I was I, the only thing my brain was giving me was ultralist. <laughs> and I was like, that's not really helpful for for most people. Kabuterimon. <laughs> that's the one. Yeah. Uh, not Kabuterimon. Uh, uh. Oh wait. Uh. Oh, it's the other one. Not Kabuterimon. Kabuterimon doesn't. He uh only has that when he goes above. Oh, it's the red one. The before Kabuterimon. No, because Kabuterimon just has the the, the horn, horn and like. He has mouth like this, right. not pincers. And then there's uh, Tentamon before that. Tentamon before that. Uh, but then there's the big Kabuterimon. Hercules Kabuterimon is the right. mega above. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, 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 which had a weird name, doesn't it? Yeah. It's, it's not as easy as like mega Kabuterimon. Yeah. Well, it's. um. This is Digimon, by the way. Yeah. Which, considering that we know Rebecca from Dragon Con, uh, you might already know this. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, we could we could actually leave this in because I was planning on <laughs> Rebecca it. Would, Rebecca would appreciate it. Uh, it's not. It, oh, it's right there. The you red know, one. They fight when they first get to the digital world. You know what? You keep talking about tarantulas. I'm gonna look it up. I'm gonna be so mad when he says it. You sure are. It's a lot like Kabuterimon too. Uh, but they have down facing fangs. They're both their fangs face downward, and so when they bite right. an animal, it's a stabbing motion downward. Yes. Uh, so they can't bite in the fact that they don't close their fangs on anything. They just unfurl them and stick them in. <laughs> <laughs> they still fold up under the chowasthora, but they don't close on anything. They just stab downward, uh, which is... It, well, it's, if you think of, like, the funnel, uh, uh, the Australian uh, um, funnel web spider... The famous one of the famous spiders for having the longest fangs, right, is close relative to what we think of a tr- of tarantulas. They're in that same overall group, uh, and if you ever see a picture of them, they are very aggressively defensive, and they will raise up on their back four legs with their front four. Oh yeah, yeah. Up, and then they will display their fangs, which flip out like viper fangs, not like um ant mouth. So they strike much more like venomous snakes than like a typical spider bite and as far as i know other than like i think the sydney funnel web is has a pretty nasty bite but most other tarantulas their bite is not known for its toxicity right because when you're a giant spider you're not actually needing to quickly kill with venom i've already wrestled you to the ground the venom is just how i'm ending your life but right (laughs) you're (laughs) You're not going anywhere. I've already taken you down. Uh, so I don't think they have the same quick acting venom and, and highly deadly venom, or at least not for most of the group. Yeah. Now, I also, while I was doing a quick breeze by of the internet on tarantulas, uh, I believe there are fossil tarantulas. Yes. But like very few. Yeah. I they, think in amber. Well, and, and the tricky thing with them is because they are larger 
they don't fossilize in amber often. Right. So they don't get caught very often. Yeah. And so a lot of our big bodied spiders are going to be sedimentary, you know, in the dirt and spiders don't fossilize in the dirt very often. So we, yeah. we do get large bodied spider fossils. So tarantulas and other large spiders, uh, but not very often. Most of our spider fossils are amber and they don't get stuck in amber very often. So we do have them, but as far as I know, they're not as well represented. Uh, yeah. Which makes sense. Yes. And is very unfortunate. Yeah. Another interesting thing about handling tarantulas, uh, which if you've ever handled one, you might already know this, but you actually have to be careful about handling them too much. Uh, a lot of people at the aquarium would only be able to pick up uh, Rosie, uh, if I'm remembering her name right, with uh, surgical gloves. Because even if she doesn't kick her hairs, because mm-hmm. their hairs have those little microscopic hooks to... They, they're, it's like fiberglass. That's what it's been. Right. That's what it's akin to structurally, uh, to getting your skin and getting your eyes and itch and irritate. Uh, even if she doesn't kick, she's covered in them. Right. So like my hands would mildly itch after I handled her. <laughs> like I could feel just a slight irritation, nothing bad. But if you handle her over and over again on a regular basis, you can develop an aller- allergic reaction. Oh yeah, I have heard that. So. A lot of the people who worked with her uh, would be like, all right, I have to go clean her enclosure and put on some gloves to pick her up or else I'm going to get hives because I've picked her up one too many times and her little hairs have embedded into my skin one too many times and now I'm now I'm allergic. Weird. Yeah. Uh, also, fun fact about their hairs, uh, uh, to my knowledge, that was the original itching powder. Oh, interesting. That joke shop sold. It was just tarantula hairs. Weird. Uh, which is both like, huh, and also... Gross joke shops. Right. Stop that. What is wrong with you? <laughs> also, how did you get them? Right. Because that's... I you don't... You just have to pluck a tarantula? Because either... No matter how you got them, that is either a dead or unhappy tarantula. Like, yeah. there is no humane version <laughs> of... De-hairing a tarantula. No. They don't shed like a dog. and You can just right. vacuum up their enclosure <laughs> and be like, there we go, some itching powder. So, that's bad. All right. Kabuterimon digivolves into Mega Kabuterimon. Yes. Which it might be the one you're thinking nope. of. So Mega Kabuterimon comes in both a red and a blue version. Yep. There is a Hercules Kabuterimon. Which does have some of those pincers, but I don't actually know if they're closing mouth part versions. And there is also Grand Kuwagamon. Kuwagamon, that's it. Kuwagamon, there you go. So Kuwagamon is apparently uh, what you're thinking of. Although Hercules Kabuterimon apparently also has another form called Tyrant Kabuterimon, which is, looks like a xenomorph thing. Yeah, which is completely off the rails. Kuwagamon is the red Digimon that they first fight when they first entered the Digimon, the digital world. Oh, That's so not this one. Gotcha. Yeah. Not, so not at all Kabuterimon. Not at all Kabuterimon, but he has the same no eyes, face, forearms. Yes. He and is a red alternate Kabuterimon. What they were fighting in the valley in the new Digimon yeah. episode where we see Mega Kabuterimon for the first time. Kuagamon makes an sh- appearance in just about everything Digimon at some point. Okay, Because it's yes. like the classic bad guy. Yeah. Kuagamon. Or if you prefer, Vikavolt from uh, Pokemon Gen 7. Yes. Which also has those mandibles. Anyway, if you'd like to learn more about the various Digimon, I'm on the Digimon Wiki, <laughs> so uh, oh, you can enjoy that. That was going to drive me insane, well, Rebecca. Well, I'm glad we brought it up. <laughs> that was going to... Ju- I would not have been able to sleep tonight if I couldn't remember <laughs> Quagamon. Rebecca, oh. thank you for getting us to talk about tarantulas, and also a little uh, detour into the digi the digital world. <laughs> there is a tarantulamon. <laughs> of course there is. Uh, and it has its two little pedipalps uh are the front little short legs are holding its hair uh which i always thought was really funny uh, and adorable that's cute uh yeah there is a tarantula mon well thanks for inspiring this mini discussion uh perhaps someday we'll talk more about tarantulas uh in other episodes in the future probably someday we'll talk more about digimon in other episodes in the future yeah thanks for being such a big fan of ours rebecca and thanks for supporting us on patreon we really appreciate it Thank you so much, and hopefully we'll be able to see you at the next Dragon Con since nothing's gonna go wrong. Everything 2022. That's gonna that's the year. It's gonna be great. 
Oh man, stop right. doing that. We gotta end this on a high note. <laughs> high note. We're excited. Woo! Our patrons and fans. This was a fun discussion. Tarantulas, they got little clack claws, and when they sh- and, and shed they, their skin, they can regrow limbs. And they hold their hair back. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. Hello, David. Hello, Will. And hello, Hobart. Welcome to your mini Patreon episode. As one of our top tier patrons, you got to request a personalized episode on the subject of your favorite animal or group of animals. And you selected Dilophosaurus. A very cool choice. Which is yeah, an awesome choice. <laughs> Dilophosaurus. So we are going to have a mini discussion all about Dilophosaurus, which is handy because I've got plenty to say about Dilophosaurus. Same. Dilophosaurus is an interesting dinosaur because in my brain, Dilophosaurus is sort of the go-to classic early big predatory dinosaur. Yeah. Yes. Dilophosaurus is early Jurassic theropod. And I believe Dilophosaurus was discovered. I believe it was named in the, in the, I think, 1970 All right. is when Dilophosaurus was named, although I think there were early specimens known that were later reassigned to Dilophosaurus. And for a long time, we didn't really know a lot of early uh, Jurassic and Triassic large predatory dinosaurs. Yeah. The Dilophosaurus is one of these these go-to early big predators. And I remember when I first learned about how big they were, uh, I was surprised as a kid because, unsurprisingly, my intro to them Mm -hmm. was Jurassic Park. Yes. uh, Where they added the frill added the venom poison spit Mm -hmm. and made them tiny. In the book, they're not. Yeah. In the book, Dilophosaurus is normal Dilophosaurus size. But in the movie, uh, they only show the tiny version, which is either because that they are tiny or that that was supposed to be a young one or whatever. Well, and I could definitely see from a, a movie perspective, like a creature creator's perspective, if they're like, all right, so you're telling me this dinosaur has a big, display frill and it spits toxic goo mm-hmm. like yeah and it should be pretty big and they're like right well that doesn't make sense what <laughs> like if you're gonna have a little s- s- uh, uh, uh screeching spitting thing you don't also make it the size of a car right like that's ridiculous <laughs> well yes well, and, no creature creator you are correct <laughs> and also from the movie perspective it's so we have a giant scary dinosaur and we have a human-sized scary dinosaur and this one is another human-sized scary dinosaur Let's yep. make it a small, scary dinosaur. Well, and that's the thing that's particularly funny to me is, and I think the Lost Horse is, a, 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 you know, actually slightly bigger than the Velociraptors were. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, it is. It's bigger than that, but it's not so much bigger that the movie would feel different. Right. <laughs> but then they made it the size that really the Velociraptors should have been. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, you could have had the Velociraptors doing that kind of scene and it, we could have had Dilophosaurus's right, well, running th- and that would have been awesome. The depiction of Dilophosaurus in Jurassic Park has also led to Dilophosaurus being possibly the most misrepresented dinosaur in pop culture because that image of a small, frilled, venom-spitting dinosaur has been reused over and over and over again. So many times. It's shown up in video games. It showed up, I think I think it was Magic the Gathering, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. has a dinosaur card that is basically that, which is a shame because actual Dilophosaurus is a super cool dinosaur. And in my opinion, way cooler than Jurassic Park's version. Yeah. Like, both both because it's bigger mm-hmm. and a, 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 a more intimidatingly sized predator, but also its face looks way cooler than the way they made it look. Yeah. Well, it's got that cool kink in the jaw. Yeah, that little hook. That um, little hook at the end. Oh, I love it so much. Also, Dilophosaurus is named Dilophosaurus, two-crested saurus, for its double crests on top of its head. Yeah. Which is interesting to me because these days, the idea of theropod dinosaurs, predatory dinosaurs with crests, head crests, is not uncommon. No, that is not a bizarre concept. We In the Tyrannosaurus episode, we talked about early Tyrannosaurs, uh, Guanlong, I think, and Proceratosaurus that have those. 
Cryolophosaurus, of course, famously has the head crest. But I'm pretty sure Dilophosaurus was the first dinosaur I ever learned about, which was a theropod dinosaur with a prominent skull crest. Yeah, that's probably true for me as well. And I want to say, I, this might not be true, but I don't think we knew of a lot of head-crested predatory dinosaurs for a long time. So for quite a while, Dilophosaurus was one of the only ones, I think, that we knew of. Yeah. Which is a really interesting... And even today, head-crested theropods are not very commonly known in the but fossil yeah, they're, record. They're not, uh, <laughs> by any means, the norm... No, they're not like ceratopsians or hadrosaurs, Mm -mm. where that was very, very common. But the idea of a, you know, eight or ten foot tall predatory animal with just two cool looking crests on its face makes it a very interesting dinosaur. Well, and it's, uh, as crests tend to do immediately, evokes the question of, what were you doing with them? Right. That That is a display feature almost surely. It, it's basically gotta be, which then immediately makes me assume that oh, Dilophosaurus must have been so noisy. Yeah. Oh. Were you noisy? Were you, did you d- do funny dances? Yeah. Were you like waving your head around in particular ways? Well, I I think about how some birds, even the ones who don't do elaborate displays, Well, like, you know, lift their heads up and stand up as tall as they can. Or or have a dance they do. Stretch out their neck and puff out their chest. Was this giant, much bigger than a human-sized animal doing those sorts of displays? It's a murdered bird of paradise. Yeah. Well, (laughs) and and the thought that, you know, it's so odd to us these days to think of an animal of that size needing to display. Yeah. Because animals that that size today tend not to do anything particularly elaborate. It's like, well, yeah, you're a bear. We noticed you. Yep. You did not need to do anything unusual to be noticed. But perhaps in a world where you lived alongside early sauropods. Yep. Maybe you did need to do something a little extra to be to to stand out in your environment. Yeah. When it it, it then brings into the question of. Does this mean that you were social? You know, mm-hmm. like, were you hanging out regularly around others? You're not necessarily like pack hunting or even like group living, but were you interacting regularly or was this like only during breeding season? Right. Or was this more of a territoriality thing? Yeah. And you were using them in t- actively to not interact yes. with others. Was it the opposite of a social yeah. display? Is it an anti-social display? Yeah. Did you have big uh, eye spots? Well, that's the other of, thing. Of even larger predators. Yeah, that's the thing that <laughs> I, I was wondering about it is what soft tissue was covering that? Yeah, and as far as I know, we don't know the answer to that for any theropod head crest. No, not that I've ever heard of. No. Like, is it just skin? You know, and if so, was it colored? Was it patterned? Mm-hmm. Or was there things coming off the skin? You know, did you have, right. you know, like, like, sp- Spines, you know, like like iguana spines coming off it. Of, like you could have all sorts of soft tissue stuff growing off those things, and it's they're a perfect platform for it. Like, yeah, you could do all sorts of crazy stuff with that. And I want to know. Well, and I I think that those kinds of questions, and even even if they were just the crests, just the shape that we have, yes, yeah, in the bone, which is unlikely, they were probably covered with keratin mm-hmm. and or skin or scales or something. But I, for me, it's really interesting to think you know, in our Tyrannosaurus episode, you know, T-Rex is the classic image of a theropod dinosaur. Yes. Like that is the shape you expect of a theropod dinosaur. And so many of the most famous theropods generally fit that same basic shape. Allosaurus is like that. Megalosaurus is like that. But we know that Early tyrannosaurs, like the ones we mentioned in that episode, had head crests. Mm -hmm. And the fact that Dilophosaurus is also an early big theropod with head crests. And, you know, Cryolophosaurus is also, I think, early Jurassic. Oh, yeah, I don't remember. With its wacky head crest. The thought that early theropods, and perhaps theropods all across the range, 
didn't all have the sort of bare skull that we associate with things like t- most tyrannosaurs. And even tyrannosaurs have the little, you know, often have the little horns. Yeah, and the, the little knobbly eyebrows. Knobs and stuff. That head ornamentation is pretty common among theropod dinosaurs and was apparently pretty common early on, even among some of the biggest ones like Dilophosaurus. Yeah. That's really cool because we don't, I don't know, I don't associate those kind of display features with the image in my head of big predators like that. Well, and I think part of that, uh, I think, could potentially be that most of the large predators we have, you know, the terrestrial predators we have are mammals. Yes. You know, the only ones that get up into the, that size category are a couple of lizards and crocs. Mm-hmm. And the lizards and crocs aren't doing it. And mammals don't like you get antlers and, and horns and herbivores. Sure, sure. But mammals don't do that kind of display f- structure. Not quite that way. Not it, often like the. The most display e structure that immediately comes to mind for big predatory mammals is like a lion's mane. Yes. Which is soft tissue. Which is all soft tissue. That's hair. And even when you just get into mammals in general, like you get some really vibrant displays in like primates and some mm-hmm. other groups and you get antlers and stuff, which are both display, but also competition. Yeah. Uh, so they have a structural, you know, physical function. Uh, but mammals don't seem to do they don't display like birds do no or not even like lizards do. no yeah and so like it, it's it's one of those where were you doing this as a large predator because things were different back then or are you had just a different kind of large predator that this was just theropods displayed yeah this is what happens when reptiles are that size yeah this is their version of a lion <laughs> before lions yep <laughs> and that's how they displayed which is such an interesting concept uh and honestly mammals up your game because right this you guys start double mohawk crest come on right well and again i it, it it is my official stance that i adamantly believe that dinosaurs were doing silly dances and singing silly songs oh yeah and being very vocal and animated like birds yes and so i love this image of these large extremely intimidating predators resorting to elaborate displays like birds do. Yes. Even if they're passive displays and they're colorful or they just have lots of, you know, their own sort of feathery mane. But I, I, I don't know if we'll ever know for sure, but my head cannon, <laughs> my dinosaur head cannon is that Dilophosaurus and all of its friends did silly dances yes. and sang songs. Well, and like the, the thing that's neat about that is you can have just the entire gambit of those kinds of displays. Like, yeah. you could have them doing silly, ridiculous Bird of Paradise dances, or you could have them doing crazy kookaburra songs. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you could also have, like, the croc thing where you're just chilling, and then all of a sudden you just make one real loud noise. <laughs> and all the birds fly away. Yeah. Well, I, I, not in the early Jurassic no, no. <laughs> All the pterosaurs yes. fly out of the trees. <laughs> and you just, every now and then you just hear this, oh, it's like, oh, Dilophosaurus is, it's that time of year. I saw a video online. This was a little while ago. It was going around. I think this was on Twitter of someone that had taken a video of an elk just trotting along a road and halfway along its trot does the elk noise. That bugle. That bu- that just ridiculous horrifying bugle noise <laughs> otherworldly yeah, scream. It, is, it is an otherworldly scream and yes i want that to have been true and i refuse to believe it wasn't true for at least some dinosaur at some point absolutely that dilophosaurus would just be trucking through the the woods on its territory and then just go <laughs> yeah, out into the out into the environment. If out of over a hundred million years of dinosaurs, <laughs> we don't have that, then the Earth is just just missing all the opportunities. Yeah. One of the things I just I would love to see is a proper Dilophosaurus in popular media. 
Yeah. Uh, and I've only I only can think of one example where I've seen that, and I've not played this game. I I looked at it on my wish list on Steam for quite a while, but never actually got it because it was a multiplayer game, and I don't play those. But Dinosaur D Day, where it was a World okay. War Two uh, team versus team shooter uh, with dinosaurs. Um, oh right. So it was allies versus Axis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you were you had soldiers, so you could be the soldiers, but then you could also. I think it was one of those where it's like, all right, every so often your team gets a chance for someone to come in as a dinosaur, and like the little dinosaur, someone will always be coming in. Mm-hmm. But then on a timer is the slightly larger. I don't know exactly what the mechanics were, but each team had their dinosaurs. Uh, and the allies had a lot of herbivores. Uh, yeah. they had a, uh, um, the allies had a, a notosaur with a heavy gun on its back. Okay. Uh, so like a lot of them had guns attached and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, especially the non bitey ones. Uh, but then the axis had all the cool ones cause the bad guys get all the cool ones. Bad guys. Yep. yep. Uh, they of course had the T-Rex with machine guns on its little arms. <laughs> <laughs> cause yeah. Yeah. But one of them was a Dilophosaurus. That, if I remember right, didn't have any guns, but was just a upper-sized unit, and it was correctly sized, so you would just be able to rush in and just one bite kill a bunch of people. But one of the things it could do is it could kill someone and then pick up their body in its mouth and chuck it at people. <laughs> uh, and it's the first thing I've ever seen that made them look correct. Like, it looked pretty decent. And it was big. Yeah. And then it utilized its size. It was, they were like, no, no, this is big. And we're going to make a, that's part of its mechanics. That's pretty cool. I've never seen anyone. I would love something to be like, oh no, we brought back a dinosaur. And it's a big Dilophosaurus that comes in being all cool and creepy looking. Yeah. And just terrifying. Like they're, they're so toothy. They're just waiting to be made a monster movie creature. They are very cool dinosaurs. Hobart, thank you for this suggestion. This has been a fun discussion. This was a good one. We haven't gotten to discuss Dilophosaurus and main series episodes just yet, but certainly in the future, it will happen. In the meantime, thank you so much for your support, your patronage, and your your listening and being a fan of our podcast. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much. For now, we will wrap up this uh, I- I- this rendition of a mini episode. We hope you've enjoyed it as much as we've enjoyed recording it and discussing it. Till next time. See you around. Bye. Hello, Will. Hello, David. Hello, Quags, and welcome to your very own patron mini-episode. As you already know, at your level of subscription on Patreon, you get to suggest a topic for your own little mini-episode for us to just riff about for a little bit, just for you, and you suggested a turtle. Actually, you suggested two turtles, (laughs) um, one of which you said was your runner-up, but we're going to talk about both because they're awesome. (laughs) The Mata Mata, uh, which the internet tells me, is Chilis fimbriata, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but also Chilis orinocensis. Yes. Because I think it was split recently yeah. uh, from what I'm reading on Wikipedia. Yep, yep. That's what it looked the like to me, too. Two different uh, turtles that are technically matamatas are very much like matamatas. But the other one is the pignose turtle. Yeah. Coretta Achilles in Sculpta. And if you had named, if you had said, talk about the matamata and the runner up, my runner up idea was this other really boring turtle then we maybe would have ignored it. <laughs> but your runner-up was the pig nose turtle, so we're going to talk about that turtle too, because yeah. it is possibly my favorite turtle. It's pretty sweet. <laughs> They're so cool. Uh, Mata Mata is also a very cool turtle. Yeah, I used to use a Mata Mata uh, cast skull uh, when I worked at the aquarium all the time, because we I would do a talk to discuss the differences of different kinds of skulls and what they teach us about the animals and how you can recognize different features in a predator and a prey item and so on and so forth. And the Mata Mata was always great just to be the weirdest skull on the table. They're so bizarre. (laughs) They're all flattened, knobbly and broad. Well, and I loved their bottom jaw because like if you think about our bottom jaw, we've got where the teeth are and then the two portions that come up to hinge with our skull Mm -hmm. yes the ascending ramus yeah way in the back so ours has that bend at the front and then two projections going up in the back the mata matas is almost that same shape 
but you have to flip it upside down to fit it to the skull. Yes. It comes from the joints at the bottom, goes <laughs> up to the front of the mouth, and then has the little curve for where their lips yes. aren't. They are uh, they are a very bizarre shaped animal in the same way. So so the Mata Mata turtle sort of image is this flat, knobbly turtle. Mm-hmm. And their skull is flat and knobbly. And they've got these little dingle ding, dangles hanging off of their face. Yeah, they're meant to look like dead leaves at the bottom of the river. Yes, they've got a flat neck with flaps off to the sides. Their shell is nice and flat and knobbly. And yeah, they're meant to look like dead leaves or dead wood or, you know, plant material. Now, and they've, they've got, uh, their head is very leaf-shaped. Yes. It's got that arrow shape to it. So they fall into a consistent pattern in animal evolution of animals evolving ridiculously contorted body shapes to look like plants. Yep. Which is a thing that we, we see that like there are snakes that have leaf shaped faces, but it's something that we see very commonly in invertebrates. Yeah. There are tons of insects that are like this that are so incredibly plant shaped that they no longer look like the type of insect that they're supposed to be. Mm -hmm. It's utterly bizarre to see that in a turtle. Yeah. That is not a group of animals that I would have expected to go the completely different body shape to look like dead plant material. Yeah. Well, and they're doing it for the same reason that a lot of snakes do it, which is to set up ambushes to be able to hide and, have prey get too close. Yeah, yeah. Mata mata turtles uh, use suction feeding. Yes. They vacuum up their prey. Yeah, buccal suction. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they have a cool uh, apparatus. So buccal suction is they open their mouth really quick, creating a cavity in their throat that water then must rush in to fill that vacuum. Right, they create negative space. Yep. And it pulls whatever is in front of their mouth in with that water. Just like fish. Yes. Uh, tons of fish feed this yeah, way. Yeah, groupers and are, are the one that's famous for just inhaling things into the stomach. Mm-hmm. Like, groupers can get it from <laughs> mouth to stomach. Uh, but then they'll pump, push out the water out of their throat and then swallow the fish. But they have this, and I think it's their hyoid, this really complicated bone structure in their neck that was with the skull that we had. Because they have a very specialized neck. Because other turtles don't feed that way. Right. This is something fairly unique. I don't know for sure that I can say it's the only turtle, but I haven't heard of other turtles that use full on suction feeding. Yeah, I've heard them described as unique among turtles yes. for feeding, which does not necessarily mean that they are the only ones. Yes. I'm but... sure there are ones that use partial to like, yeah. I open my mouth, it pulls some water in, gets the prey closer, and then I bite it. And I meet it halfway. Yeah. So it's still not suction feeding, but I am sucking water in. Right. Uh, but they use pure they at no point bite the fish Mm -hmm. it just goes from in the water to in their throat they don't even have a sharp beak like almost all other predatory turtles (laughs) they just inhale it (laughs) yeah it's just a a type of turtle evolved for a wholly unusual type of lifestyle yeah well and it's like if you were to look at them if i didn't know what a mono mono was and saw it you know just was walking through the water and saw it I would assume it was a snapping turtle of some sort. Oh, sure. Because it's got that knobbly shell. It's got that long neck. It's got that big head. Right. And they hang out down at the mm-hmm. bottom of the body of water You're on all the floor. Camoed mm-hmm. to blend in with the bottom. Like snappers do. I'd assume, like a snapper or even soft shells, which have very sharp beaks, mm-hmm. that you'd take my toe off if I got too close. Sure. You know, because that's what you look like. And you are hunting. In a very similar way of sit and wait for them to get too close. But no, you're doing a completely different thing and you could just gum me. <laughs> yeah, just dum, 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 dum. Just suck a toe into that into their mouth and just not do anything with it. Yeah, because that weird <laughs> bottom jaw I mentioned is also like less width than a chopstick. Mm-hmm. It is so thin, so weak. It is not robust like a snapping turtle. It is just there to lower the bottom jaw. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Well, I was looking up where they live. In fact, I'm going to pull it up right now as I'm talking just to make sure that I haven't misremembered and say it wrong. Because I was like, I'm, I think I know where they live, but let me look it up just to make sure. And yeah, they're in the Amazon. Yes. And I said, that makes sense. Yep. That's where a bizarre turtle is liable to evolve. If you were, if I was forced to guess before I knew, that's where <laughs> I would have guessed. They're also oddly cute. Yeah, they they have that sort of, no offense to Mata Mata Turtles, but they have that kind of ugly cute thing going on. Yeah, well, and and their face is all at the front of their head. 
Like, they don't have the two eyes on the side of the head and then the nose up front. Their eyes are on either side of their nostrils. Yeah. <laughs> Squished way up front like a, like a flat-faced cat. Yeah. All the way up at the front. So their mouth is like three times as wide as the width of their eyes. So they have a cartoonishly <laughs> wide grin. Yeah. <laughs> There's this big dopey grin that just stretches on to either side. <laughs> they, are ju- they are utterly unique and charismatic looking. Yep. Uh, and if Quags likes Mata Matas for any of these reasons that we've just been discussing, then it makes total sense why the second choice for Turtle was Coret Achilles. Yeah. The Pignose Turtle, which are awesome, which also have dopey cute faces mm-hmm. and also have a wholly unique setup. So Coret Achilles is the only known group of turtles who are freshwater turtles with full-on flippers. Yes, fully aquatic freshwater turtles. Yes, most freshwater turtles are like soft-shell turtles. Mm -hmm. Well, they'll have webbed toes, and they'll have flattened shells, and they'll have various adaptations for swimming around in the water. Super hydrodynamic, super good at swimming. Right, but they're adapted for water in similar ways to, like, a crocodilian yeah. is adapted to water. This is obviously a land animal. Their their feet still look like feet. Yes. Whereas sea turtles are like, we have given up all hope of ever going onto land ever again for any extended period of time. Yep. We have turned our arms into flippers like a fish, like a dolphin. Coret Achilles has done that, and I, I, it's the only time that has evolved in freshwater turtles, in living freshwater turtles. Yeah, which is so cool. And the first time I learned about uh, the pig nose turtle, I immediately had that moment of, A, I hadn't realized I'd never questioned why there weren't freshwater mm-hmm. flippered turtles. Yep, never thought about it. I was it. just like, well, yeah, but sea turtle, it's right there in the name. It's If you have flippers as a turtle, you're a sea turtle. So I just had never even thought to consider that. And then immediately ask the question of why, why is there only one? Like what happened? Is this harder to do? And it's so cool that we have this one species now. And I think I I have a vague memory of hearing that there may be extinct freshwater turtles Mm -hmm. that were more aquatic adapted, like pig nose turtles. Although I don't know what they are off the top of my head or if I've made that up. Yeah, that might not be true. Uh, I also don't know if we know very much at all about the evolutionary history of pig nose turtles. Pig nose turtles are Australian, yeah, which is another place where it makes total sense that something bizarre would have evolved, unlike all the other turtles. Especially if being a flippered freshwater turtle is less common evolutionarily. Like, if right. there's something about freshwater habitats, if they're not as stable enough compared to the ocean, which are kind of always there. Mm-hmm that it makes it harder for an inland turtle to dedicate that heavily to an aquatic lifestyle. It makes sense that an isolated place yeah. is where that weird lifestyle would show up. And it, it even makes me wonder, because Australia, we famously think of as the place where marsupials mm-hmm. are very common, seemingly because where placental mammals were able to gain a foothold and basically do better than the marsupials and their ancestors everywhere else... Australia is a place where placental mammals just never quite got to that degree of success. I wonder if there's any thought on, are there a freshwater aquatic ecosystems everywhere else yep. that make it harder for Coret Achilles, for the pig nose turtles to, that kind of turtle shape, to develop and hang around there? Yes, like, absolutely. Is it that there's something? I don't. Are there are there crocs that hang out in freshwater in Australia? Oh yeah. Okay, I yeah. figured. I know salties are down yep. there. Uh, salties absolutely will go into the freshwater, but you have the freshwater croc, which is gotcha. a freshwater specialist. Makes sense. So yeah, I wonder if there is something about is is it just that this one happens to be in Australia, mm-hmm. or is there something about being isolated down there that allowed this turtle? to persist yes yeah it's it's a very interesting scenario and well and it also makes me wonder does this specialization make you more vulnerable toward competition with other turtles Mm -hmm. or does it give you an edge that those turtles you know wouldn't be able to match right are you able to live in a is it actually better 
to be a pond turtle that can still crawl out onto land and go back and forth. And that's why this isn't as common as it might otherwise be. Yes. Or is there something that you're just doing exceptionally well at? Yeah. Uh, and yeah, I don't know enough about turtle dynamics to have answers to that. Because I feel like that could be one of the big things that's different is like, even if you got more saltwater turtles, like terrapins are famous for being one of the few other turtles that are cool with salt water, mm -hmm. but aren't sea turtles. And, uh, but typically I think they're only found in like brackish water, not full on seawater. But even if we got like beach going saltwater friendly turtles, I don't think they would even be competing with sea turtles. No, I wouldn't think so. Like maybe for nesting sites. Exactly. But other than that, I don't think that there's uh, a competition. Yeah, because... Because they'd be in the shore at most. Right. Sea turtles are out in deeper water. Yeah, they would be. They are oceanic. Mm -hmm. Sea turtles are going wherever they want. <laughs> I wonder if that there's just not that many lakes big enough to have that distinction of habitat that like if you are a you know, legged turtle, you can still swim across this giant lake or, or into the deeper parts of this giant lake if you want so yeah. that your habitats don't have that separation they are going to overlap so there'd be nowhere for a flipper turtle to get away from the competition that being said i do know there are some massive lakes and i also am i definitely have that bias that i think tons of people have where it's hard for me to fathom how big some lakes are because <laughs> a lake is something that you can look across in my mind well and i think that 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 suggestion made me think i wonder if one of the reasons that it may be more widespread and beneficial for turtles not to adapt quite such an aquatic lifestyle is that fresh water tends to vary. Yep. Like ponds and streams and rivers tend to dry and, and become deeper and shallower over the years, over the seasons, and that it might be very beneficial to be able to not only move from one to the other, mm -hmm. but also to survive in varying depths yes. it may be that if there isn't enough fresh water that is of a certain depth that lifestyle just doesn't work yeah that you're just not going to survive I, I i've got wikipedia here and wikipedia uh, unfortunately does not give me any details on the depth of their habitats <laughs> it just says freshwater streams rivers and lagoons uh so i don't know all right that is it that is a fascinating question it's also one of those where I don't think I would have expected, I would have thought of them much more of like lake goers, but yeah. river goers is not, would not have been my guess. I think of river turtles as being ones that hug the bottom, you know, are using their claws to yeah. go under the flow of the water and stick to the bottom. Yeah. I wonder if these are the, the big rivers. Yeah, exactly. The slow moving big rivers. Yeah. The other thing, of course, about pig snouted turtles is that they have a little pig snout. They are so cute. They have a little extended, little fleshy, movable nose. Yeah, a little with snorkel its, snout. With its two nostrils at the end of it, or like a very tiny taper <laughs> snout. <laughs> yep. Uh, we got to meet a pig nosed turtle yes. many years ago at the Columbia Zoo in South Carolina. Uh, I, had, I had had never and have never seen one mm -mm. before or since that. That yep. is the only time I've ever met a pig nose turtle we got to go behind the scenes and get up nice and close to it yeah and it they were it's super cute it's so cute i also was not at all familiar with them before that moment so that Same. was that was very much like both feet in here's this animal <laughs> i had heard of them yeah well because uh that was back when we were in grad school and uh we went there on a school trip and one of the other people on that trip was steve because yes. me and steve had joined the trip and Steve is a turtle expert, and Steve and I had worked together and lived together for quite a while. And he and I had had conversations geeking out about pig's no pig nose turtle. Yep. Because Steve has good taste and also agrees <laughs> that this is one of the best turtles that there is. And I remember we went in, we were, we were getting a showed around behind the scenes in the zoo, and I saw it. And I went over and I was like, Steve, come here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> come on over here, man. You got to see this. Uh, and he was giddy he was <laughs> utterly delighted to see this turtle it was very cool that was also the trip where we got to meet some giant tortoises yes. up close which was also very cool it was a, it was a good trip for turtles yes it was. <laughs> it was a good turtle trip yeah <laughs> 
It's also neat because their little flippers have teeny tiny little claws at the ends. Yeah. And I've seen pictures that are where it's like they're lit from behind mm-hmm. and you can see the fingers inside the flippers. Yeah. Which is they look like mittens. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. They are. Yeah. One of the coolest turtles by far. Yes. And it's it's re- these two turtles are very fun because they are exciting and fun for di- for very similar reasons. Mm hmm despite living and having evolved on vastly different pathways. Oh, yeah, being entirely distinct physically. Like, and... Mata Matas are bizarre because they're doing something that is just super weird for a turtle to do, or at least they have evolved to an extreme we don't see mm-hmm. in a lot of turtles. Whereas pig turtles are like, no, no, we're doing the same thing as a bunch of other turtles, just in a place that none of them do it. Yes, it, it's yeah. It looks like an itty bitty sea turtle, but with like a soft shell turtle shell. Yeah. It's 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 just off of being a sea turtle. <laughs> Very strange. And they both uh, turn out to be super cute, which yeah. uh, presumably is why the planet has kept them around. Yes. Uh, if pignose turtles and matamatas go extinct, we riot. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. <laughs> we will protect them. Burn it all down. <laughs> uh, I th- at least one of them is probably endangered. Oh, I'm. Uh, I think I, I, I vaguely recall seeing that Matamatas are not. Yeah. But I don't have a reference for that, so I could mm-hmm. be wrong. They're in the Amazon. One imagines that they are in. They are threatened. Yes. Because the Amazon is threatened. Yep. It's it, it and for a very similar reason, I I'd assume the single Australian yeah. <laughs> flippered turtle. Is probably also yeah. At least should be ha- have an eye being being kept on it. Yes. <laughs> so two very awesome types of turtles. Uh, very fun to talk about. These these are cool ones because these are the kind of turtles that we see the name. We go, yeah, I know that turtle. Yep. Let's talk about that turtle. Yep. <laughs> Wonderful suggestion, Quags. Thank you for inspiring us to talk about both of these. Very good taste. Uh, you have very good taste. Uh, hopefully you enjoy these turtles for some of the same reasons that we enjoy these turtles. Uh, no, we've just said all the wrong things. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what are you talking no, about? They're no, ugly. No. That's why I like them. <laughs> I, was ho- I was hoping that this was going to be dunking yeah, we were, on these turtles. going to be a roast. <laughs> <laughs> a turtle roast. That's why they're in danger. Yes. Thank you for your suggestion. Thank you, of course, for supporting us on Patreon. Uh, Thank you for sticking with us and being a dedicated listener and uh, giving us both moral encouragement and financial support. Yes. We hope you've enjoyed this mini episode and we hope that you will continue to listen and support into the future. And with that, let's wrap it up. Yeah. And get on to other stuff. Mm -hmm. Bye. Bye, Quags. Hello, David. Hello, Will. And hello, Taya. And welcome to your personal patron episode. As you already know, our upper patrons get to request their own special individual episode about their favorite life form. And you requested whales. Whales! Which is a great suggestion. Oh, that's so good. What a cool group of animals. Whales are... I am flabbergasted by whales constantly. Mm-hmm. Just, just not, they just seem kind of wrong. Yeah. Well, it's like not only for how big they get, but this the diversity of like I'll I'll I'm always a little bit surprised when I learn about a new whale or dolphin because those are all in the overall sure. whale group. Cetaceans. Mm-hmm. I'll learn about some new species of like toothed whale and just be like, a that's super weird. B how is there another? How are you hiding these? Right. How haven't we found this before? None of these are <laughs> actually small. <laughs> Even the smallest ones, <laughs> like dolphins and porpoises, are still human size. Yes. Yeah, like the <laughs> smallest porpoise is as big as we are. <laughs> yeah. And if we're and if we're counting the things we colloquially refer to as whales, then like that's bus sized and up. Yeah. <laughs> like that's. How do we, well, and for me, one of the things that I often find happens with whales is that I, and this happens with a lot of animals, I have an image in my head of what a whale looks like, Mm -hmm. and it is mostly wrong. Yep. I have a very incorrect, every time I see a whale, I'll look at the the, the imagery, I'll look at the video or whatever and go, oh, your flippers are shaped kind of oddly, and Mm -hmm. your tail's a little weird, and your face is a little weird, and why are your eyes over there? There's all this weird diversity. Yep. In the shape of 
the bodies of this group of animals that you would think their bodies shouldn't vary that much mm -hmm. because you're doing a very specific job. You're supposed to be fish shaped. Well, and I think, a, which uh, I guess is a weird, cause I guess <laughs> very obvious follow up to that is, yeah, but fish are shaped in a thousand yes. different ways. Yep. So I guess that makes sense. <laughs> We're doing our best, the whales say. I, I think a big part of that is I had that realization when I was a kid and, and recently when I tried to draw a whale from memory. And both in my drawing and in most cartoon whales, the whale that you see, you know, the, 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 these drawn whales are often an amalgamation of a bunch of different whales. Mm -hmm. Like they've got the face of a sperm whale, but then the flippers of a right whale and then the tail of like they've got all these weird features that just are kind of smushed together to be the generic whale. Yeah. And yeah, it, I I ran, I tried to draw one and I was trying to be accurate, like mm -hmm. not lifelike because I'm not that good of a, a, a sketcher. Sure. But I was trying to be kind of proportioned and kind of anatomically shaped. And when I finally looked it up, I was like, yeah, this isn't really any of them. Yep. This doesn't actually match any of them. I've taken like the chin of a right whale and the, but then the, the top is much more like a, like a humpback whale. And yeah. Well, you see, the problem is it's so hard to see all of a whale at once. <laughs> so you only ever see parts of the whales. <laughs> they the... don't they don't fit in the camera all at the same time. Well, yeah, that's four different blind wise men <laughs> would yes. say it's, it's a tarp. And it's... <laughs> that's right. They would think that it was five different animals. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the, one of the things that I find wh whales are such an interesting group of animals in part because of how successful they are, both in the way that that seems to make sense and the way that it doesn't. Like, mm. This is a group of mammals that moved into the ocean and became the best things in the ocean. Yeah. But they are the biggest things in the ocean. They are some of the most widespread animals in the ocean. They are diverse. They hunt basically everything. Like yeah. there, There is a whale that eats basically everything else in the ocean. And on the one hand, that seems like a very bizarre... The, the mammals do not belong in the ocean. Yeah. That's that's one of a, a handful of times that's ever happened. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, whales are the latest in a very long evolutionary tradition of secondarily aquatic animals taking over the oceans. Yeah. Reptiles, did, multiple groups of reptiles did it many different times. Arguably, different groups of fish have also taken turns mm -hmm. sort of being in charge of the oceans. Whales are astonishingly similar to ichthyosaurs and mosasaurs, not only in their sort of body shape and aquatic adaptations, but in their diversity mm -hmm. and how widespread they are and the various different lifestyles that they live. Yep. Like we have evidence for deep diving ichthyosaurs and we have mosasaurs and plesiosaurs and ichthyosaurs with all sorts of different diets very much like we see in whales today yeah well and i think to your point though about it, it it feeling odd and the part that's always just just baffled me is that they are the largest things to have ever swam in the ocean and include the largest animal to have ever lived on the planet mm -hmm. so it's like that that right there is notable just by itself but yet you're not even originally from the ocean you came back to it yeah and then hit those sizes yeah you came in and did something that none of the ocean creatures have done before not even the ones who evolved here yes like why why is the largest sharks we've ever known still nowhere near yeah. the sizes of the big whales it feels like the there that trope in movies where like someone from the Western countries will travel to like an Asian, you know, community or martial artist or whatever thing and then become the best at yep, it. Yep. <laughs> and be like, as it turns out, I'm the best at martial arts or whatever the feature of this movie is. Yes. And I've seen people who are like, that 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 seems a little bit self-serving, mm -hmm. doesn't it? Whales did that. Yes. <laughs> they they came into the ocean and went, we're not from here. But we're going to be the best at it. Yeah, no. <laughs> Whales feel like the last samurai of animals. <laughs> and it is super bizarre. Because, yeah, I and I don't know a ton about all the anatomical reasons because I don't study these animals. Sure. But, like, yeah, why? 
There have been massive fish. Of course. And there have been fish, whale-sized fish. Yes, but that's not the common, but it is fairly common for whales. And (laughs) and that's another thing that's sort of fascinating about whales, very much like sauropods, Mm -hmm. where there are tons of animals, like sharks. Sharks are a great example of this, where sharks range from huge. There are giant sharks. There are basking sharks Mm -hmm. and whale sharks, which are utterly enormous. But the smallest sharks are itty bitty. Oh, yeah. Tiny, tiny little things. Like could curl up in your hand. And this is the case with a lot of different groups of animals, especially animals that famously reach really big sizes. Many groups of fish range from the size of a small whale to uh, basically microscopic, you know, little tiny species. We talked about this with some groups of dinosaurs where they get really small, but they also get really big. Whales have almost a lower limit, Mm -hmm. like we talked about with sauropods. It was like, yeah, for sauropods, cow-sized is about as low as we're going to go. Yep. That we will not be smaller than that. Whales are like that. Uh, The ittiest, bittiest whales are still some of the largest animals on the planet. Yep. And then they just go up from there. They have specialized in a way that they, they doesn't, whatever they're doing doesn't even seem to work at smaller sizes. Exactly. So they, they are just very unique. And that sets them apart from the other dominant second, secondarily aquatic groups that you were mentioning earlier. Like, there were small mosasaurs and there were small ichthyosaurs mm-hmm. and plesiosaurs. Although I think that the smallest ichthyosaurs and mosasaurs were also relatively large. Yeah. Like, maybe, I, I, I like, at least a few feet long. Yeah, and, and yeah, and that's definitely... Like, uh, one or two meters long. And that's true so if we include... Even they didn't get, you know, mm-hmm. itty-bitty. Yes, uh, which is also fairly true if we include toothed whales, that, like, you get down to human-sized. Yes, so, you know, like porpoises and dolphins mm-hmm. and stuff. And, uh, which dolphins, though, are much bigger than most people think. Uh, yes. They're, like, ten feet long. Yeah, dolphins get big. <laughs> the, like, bottlenose dolphin is is massive. Aren't the river dolphins also mm-hmm. shockingly big? Yep. I think they're I think they're a little bit bigger than bottlenose, but they're definitely around the same size. Like, yeah. We're reaching double digits of right. feet. You, you moved into fresh water, but that didn't stop you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you said, no need to shrink. We'll just eat everything. Yep. So, yeah, it's, it's super interesting. Also, very weird to me how different the behaviors of similarly sized whales can be Mm -hmm. and the one that i learned about most recently which was still like probably a couple years ago or something at this point but i happened upon it because something briefly or or tangent or like passingly mentioned gray whales and them being mud sifters and Hmm. i went wait what what do you mean by and i looked it up and it was exactly what it meant they scoop up mud they like trawl. Yeah, they scoop <laughs> up silt and strain out organisms from the silt. Weird. So they're filter feeders, but they're not even filtering water. Yeah. So you've got <laughs> mud filters. You've got you know your classic blue whale humpback mm-hmm. uh, sifters, and then you've got the similarly sized sperm whales, which are the largest predatory animals on the planet. Which is just a giant, effectively dolphin. <laughs> yes, an enormous dolphin. The other thing that gets me about whales, so this is a, whales are one of those animals that are so familiar. Like whales, despite being weird, they are extremely familiar animals. Oh yeah, super charismatic. They They, are, uh, they've been in our stories and our culture for so long. Absolutely. You ask anybody, they have an idea in their head of what a whale, even though it's not what whales look like, but Mm -hmm. you have an idea in our head. And I think that the familiarity can mask some of the things that are utterly bizarre about whales, like the size of their enormous heads. Yep. Their heads are so big. Mm -hmm. Their noses are way back. And we're so familiar with the concept of a blowhole that I think we don't often stop to consider how utterly bizarre the concept of a blowhole is. That that is their nostrils. You have a (laughs) nostril. Is it a not like, is it one hole? No, I do think it's still two holes. Is it actually two holes? It has one Mm. like round, you know, almond shaped opening at the top, but there are still right. two separate down in there. Mm-hmm. There's still a septum. Yeah. If you look at a dolphin skull, them. you can see a very clear bony separation inside. Yeah. And I think it still has two fleshy openings uh, that it can close up and everything. And it's all the way back on the head. Once again, 
my mental image of a whale is that the blowhole is halfway back the body, yeah. which it isn't. <laughs> no, that is not true, <laughs> but it is way farther back than it feels like it should be. Well, and I think that's a great way to also emphasize how weird the big whales are. Like when you think of a dolphin, their blowhole is on their head and it's where you would expect it to be if I said it's on top of their head. Yes. Like within the first couple feet of their body. Sure. It is. There's their blowhole just behind the eyes above where their brain is. Well, and it's it's on that bulby part of the dolphin yeah. that looks like it's their head. Yeah, the head-shaped portion of the dolphin. Yeah. But filter-feeding whales, th- their heads are so massively boat-shaped in size. Yeah. Well, they look like a frog, <laughs> yes. like those weird big mouth <laughs> frogs where the he- the head ends somewhere, but you can't see where it is. No. It's just head to body. And so the blowhole ends up looking like it's like a third of the way down the body, but it's still at the back of the head. <laughs> yeah, it's just that the back of the head is way back there. <laughs> I remember for a little while, uh, many years ago, one of my favorite little factoids, I, I learned it and then I kept it in my head, is that the largest bone in the world is the dentary, yeah. the lower jaw of a blue whale, which, if I remember correctly, is like eight or nine meters long or so, something ridiculous. And the way that I would frame it, my the way that I liked to think about it, is that the lower jaw of the blue whale, the largest bone, the longest bone in the world, is longer than basically any land-dwelling animal in total. Yep. Like, that one bone is longer than basically any snakes, except maybe super record-breaking snakes. Yep. <laughs> it's bit like tapeworms. That's what beats the yes. lower jaw. <laughs> and that's barely a land animal. <laughs> that, they, they never touch land. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you're just swimming around and stuff. <laughs> so it's you're just operating at these ridiculous scales. Like, this is an animal that could comfortably swallow... Basically any land animal. <laughs> yep. It's it's so crazy. And and then also you get to weird stuff. Like, I think until I did the whales episode for this podcast. Mm-hmm. Episode 41, incidentally. I I don't think I knew that the filter feeders didn't echolocate. Uh, oh, yeah. Just because it had never come up. Yeah. Like whales echo. Well, this is one of those things mm-hmm. going back to we have this picture in our head that is an amalgamation of all whales. Exactly. Echolocation gets lumped in all whales, also all bats, which yes. is also not true. Mm-hmm. But and, and it's extra confusing because when you just glance, you're like, yeah, but the sperm whale does echolocate. Right. And it's the same size as like and it's five others. Enormous. Don't. Mm-hmm. It's, yep. Yeah, because echolocation is especially handy for hunting. Yes. <laughs> and the big baleen whales aren't hunting. They're grazing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> They're just scooping. Yeah. So you know, Also, I don't. I, I, I imagine echolocation would not work very well mm-hmm. in trying to identify... Like maybe shoals of fish. Clouds of plankton. Yeah, shoals of fish, perhaps. Yeah, but... Because, like, dolphins will mm-hmm. use it for that. Exactly. And I'm sure, you, like, because a lot of them do go after things like krill, which are, you know, like, four or five inches long. So like, sure. krill are not tiny, tiny. But if you're 60 feet long, yeah. I wonder if that is even, so to speak, pings on the radar. Exactly. But then it's also extra confusing, I think, because they do sing. They, like, like yes, the they famous do. whale songs, <laughs> which is a sound thing in the water, they do that. But they're not using sound to hunt, just to talk. Just to communicate. Which the others do as well. Yes. <laughs> so they all do singing and chirping and whistles. Well, and and <laughs> I also like, on the note of sounds, two thoughts. Number one, this is another one of those things that is so familiar that it bears taking a moment to stop and acknowledge that whales also have superpowers. Yes! That echolocate, you have built-in sonar. You have built-in sonar that gives you x-ray vision. That gives you x-ray vision and you can also weaponize. Yes! To stun your prey. Because bef- <laughs> because orcas are sea terminators. Yeah, so that <laughs> whales also have superpowers. But also, also, the notion, like, a, a, a acoustic communication in the ocean is cert by no means unheard of, Mm-mm. but not very common. We, we don't typically think of fish as being acoustic communicators. Sharks are not very mm-hmm. noisy animals. 
though more recent findings have been learning that fish are way noisier than we thought they were. Yeah, then that's fair. Yeah, like a reef is actually extremely noisy. We were just never listening properly. Yes, they're they're not acoustic at our Mm -hmm. uh, familiar uh, ranges. And the equipment we would bring down weren't picking it up. Mm -hmm. So... That was that was what we used to think, and they were learning that that wasn't true. But still, <laughs> right. And and what I'm getting at, I guess, is that what's super cool about whales and their habit is that it's very much like elephants, mm-hmm. where elephants are like, we happen to be big enough that we can communicate with each other for miles. Yep. Like we can make a sound no one else can make, and you can hear it for miles. And whales, like, what an incredible solution to the circumstance of living in the open ocean and having to be on the move constantly. How do you find Mm -hmm. others of your same species? And just, here's all this open space, and I'm just going to sing a tune for, I don't know how far whale song carries. Yeah, no clue. I assume that it's extremely distant. Yep. That it's preposterously far. In fact, you you say some (laughs) stuff and I'm going to Google it. Well, and it makes sense from an evolutionary perspective because they're in a medium that is especially good for transmitting sound. Yes, it's, this is a great environment to do that. Absolutely. Water transmits sound with more uh, uh, speed and and uh, energy. The energy doesn't dissipate as quickly because it's not as wispy as air is. Mm-hmm. Energy dissipates in air very quickly because air is not solid enough. Uh, which is also why elephants are able to do it because they're using the ground, which transmits sound even quicker. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and they're using infrasound through the earth. But if you live in the water and you came from a group of animals that had vocal cords, why not start yelling into the water? Just start singing. <laughs> and some of you decided to do it to communicate over miles and miles, and others decided to turn it into sonar. Uh, so I've done a quick Google. I, I Googled how far whale song. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I have found numerous results. I have not d- d- dived into any of these, so I don't know where these are coming from, that say that whale songs uh, can be heard for thousands of miles. That makes the, sense. The top result, and again, I, this is from bodyglovehawaii.com, so I, uh, mm-hmm. says 10,000 miles. <laughs> Researchers estimate that some of the lowest frequency sounds can travel through the ocean as far as 10,000 miles without losing their energy. Wow. That's unfathomable. Yes. That's a superpower. What? That that does not compute. Mm -mm. We've talked about how when it's like, wow, these fossils are millions of years old and how that just doesn't fit in your brain. Yeah, our brain can't actually calculate that. A sound traveling for thousands of miles that you could sing... In New York to someone in San Francisco, mm-hmm. and that's only 3,000. <laughs> like, that does not, I don't actually believe that. It might be true, but oh, I yeah. don't actually, like, that doesn't fit in my brain. Well, and for me, it's like, even if I can accept that that's true, I don't know how you use that. How do you make sense? Like, how is that useful? What is that? How? I I function on such a small scale compared to that yeah. that I don't know how that is being used by whales with other whales. How do you how do you receive like if you're a whale swimming along with your pod? Yeah. And you're like, "All right, we we were told to meet the our cousins here." All right, we and you sing and you go, Bruh, we are we are near Baja, California. Mm-hmm. And then you wait a while and you go, oh, they're in Hawaii. Yeah. We're in the wrong place. Well, like, and then you have to go like, well, how do you manage that? Are you just, <laughs> are whales just constantly aware of all yeah. the whales within a square 10,000 mile radius? Like, are, the, are you like Superman? Yeah. Where he'll fly up into the sky and just listen to the United States. Exactly. Like... <laughs> Are whales, are you having conversations? Like, like are, long distance? Yes. Are you pen pals? It, was it just like talking in a room where it's not even long distance? It's just like, oh yeah, no, I have an opinion on that, but I'm on in another country, Man. <laughs> but yeah. I'm listening to your conversation because I can hear it. That's, that's a, a way to achieve a hive mind. That, like, so, do, do, I don't even know how that behaviorally is, is functioning how does that make i'm sure there's been research on this oh i'm um, certainly well and this makes me think i probably i think i've said this on the podcast before but i remember reading a tale a while ago that was talking about communication between 
whales, I think it was orcas, and about how whales seem to be able to communicate different messages between mm-hmm. each other. Mm-hmm. And I had the thought, I don't remember if it was written somewhere or if I it came to me, that whales that echolocate can interpret sounds as images. Mm-hmm. Like you send out a sound, you receive a sound back, and you interpret the picture that that sound makes. Yes, the physical information. If whales are any good at mimicry, could they not send images to each other by just mimicking the sound that returned to them? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe this has been researched. If they could, is that not basically telepathy? Right? <laughs> <laughs> Let me just send. I mean, I say that, but we also can co- use sounds to communicate what yes. a thing looks like. Mm. It's just language. Yes. But that who knows what all sorts of cool things whales are able to do with their sound superpowers. Oh, yeah. As I think is evident, <laughs> we could geek out about whales all day. Oh, yeah. We have tons to say about whales. Well, we haven't even gotten into the baffling thing of like, I am constantly slightly surprised that people aren't just being swallowed by whales out in the ocean, (laughs) either on purpose or accidentally. Sure. Like orcas hunt seals and we sure are seal shaped, but they don't attack people out in the ocean. We don't sound like seals. (laughs) Right? Because they know. Yeah. And then when you go up and scoop a bunch of fish and there's a kayaker... (laughs) <laughs> and yet people are not just being it's and i assume it's just that yeah they aren't doing it because they don't want to yeah. well because a whale one time swallowed a human and then it was b- bad for it and it told every whale in the yeah, ocean it left an ocean-wide <laughs> yelp review one star would not swallow again <laughs> and they all went all right noted <laughs> they're like no nah, okay I trust I trust Jerry. Some say Jerry's Jerry message is still echoing throughout the ocean like our radio signals out into space. <laughs> yeah, it's just they uh, mind-boggling animals. Such cool creatures. So cool. Uh, Taya, feel free to reach out to us and tell us what you find most fascinating <laughs> about whales. We have discussed a small portion of it. Didn't even get into the weird ones, like narwhals and stuff. No, it's just, well, the request was whales. Yes, yep. <laughs> and that's just, there's so much to say about just the group. It's a big topic in a lot of ways. And so many ways. There's there's <laughs> narwhals and sperm walls, and there's belugas, which are super weird. <laughs> yeah. And then there's, what's the what, what are the, what's the weird ones with the tusks? Oh, uh, beaked whales. Beaked whales. Mm-hmm. Which are utterly... Uh, t- yep. uh, the whales are ridiculous. Beaked whales are so weird that it's hard to find Google images of them. Yeah. Like, I tr- was trying to find images of them for the whale episode, and there's very few pictures, even when you're just looking on normal Google image search, mm-hmm. when you're not looking for free-to-use images, there's not a lot. <laughs> Taya, thank you so much for this request and for giving us the encouragement that we ba- barely needed uh, <laughs> to geek out about whales. Uh, Thank you for supporting us. Thank you for supporting the podcast and joining us on Patreon. And we hope you've enjoyed our little geek out session. We sure did. (laughs) Yeah, we did. Oh, I remember thinking about whales all day. (laughs) Bye. Bye. Hello, David. Hello, Will. And hello, Christoph. Welcome to your personal patron episode, where you got to request for us to talk about an animal of interest, because you are one of our highest patrons, and you selected Parasaurolophus. A very good choice. Oh, Parasaurolophus has been one of my favorite dinosaurs since I was a very little kid. I think that, I don't know if this is still true. I, I would be very curious to know if it is still true that Parasaurolophus is like a go-to favorite mm-hmm. for lots of kids. But at least for our age, oh, yeah. Parasaurolophus, if not everyone's favorite, was a dinosaur that it seemed like all the dino-obsessed kids were very familiar with. Yeah. It was definitely one of the first dino names I was proud of myself for learning. Same. Because I was like, ah, I said it and I learned it. And yep. like, hey, that my was mo- not an easy one. When I was a kid, my mom and I used to call it Parasaurolophus. Yep. And then I later on picked up the, I, I mean, it's, you say it however you want. Yep. And, uh, but As I was told, you say it how your advisor says it. Yes. <laughs> but Parasaurolophus, uh, I think, is a better way of saying I like that. Yeah. I like that pronunciation yes. better. I like it Personally. a lot. Personally. 
And they're just, it, it's a very cool dinosaur for, for numerous reasons. One of the big ones, obviously, is its big head crest. Sure. Uh, but I remember the first time as a kid, I never truly registered the numbers for the sizes of dinosaurs because it's just, they're numbers yeah. on a page. Big. Big and animal. Big, blah, blah. And then I, I actually learned at some point in the past how big Parasaurolophus is. And it's like, oh my God, you're huge. Yeah, they're enormous. I wow yeah <laughs> so you're this massive you're one of the big hadrosaurs the duck bills of, as they're often called mm -hmm. you're massive and then you have this extremely distinct head crest yes uh, i've got wikipedia here just in case something like this comes up <laughs> uh, wikipedia says that the uh, length of the type specimen is estimated at nine and a half meters the th over 30 feet. 30 feet long. Like a big, big animal. Big animal. <laughs> and then that head crest is like six feet long. Yes. Like as long as we are tall. Utterly, utterly ridiculous. And, and, you know, all the things about that crest, uh, there's the hilarious history of all of the different purposes people have yeah. potentially suggested it might be for. I think that that seems to me to be one of the reasons why Parasaurolophus is so popular and so commonly discussed is that it has the same thing that Stegosaurus does yep. where every time it shows up in a kid's book or a documentary or something, there's a discussion about what was this feature for? Mm -hmm. And often the books would be like, what do you think this feature was? What, what do you think it might have been used for? It's just been one of this back and forth discussed and debated features of us trying to figure out what possible functions this weird head crest would have had. Absolutely. And while nowadays it is pretty commonly mm -hmm. fallen out that it was a noisemaker, it mm -hmm. was a resonating chamber. Yes. And, the, and possibly a display feature, yeah, of course. But absolutely. Definitely seems to have had a, a, a role in making noise. Yes. And the picture that I always think of was one of my kid dinosaur books had a picture of Parasaurolophus with an oboe coming yes. off the back of its head <laughs> to get you the idea that inside here there are many looping chambers. Yes, this is a wind instrument. It's a wind instrument. And so it is going to make noises like a musical instrument. What noise exactly, we don't know. But like, that's the idea here. Yeah. Well, Parasaurolophus also, for me, had a th very much like Stegosaurus. Where when I was a kid, I was like, oh, yeah, Stegosaurus is the one that looks like that. And then later learned there are actually lots of Stegosaurs yep. that have that. I had the same path with Parasaurolophus where I was a kid. And I was like, yeah, that's the dinosaur with the weird head crest. Mm -hmm. And then as time went on, I discovered that there's Lambiosaurus and Corythosaurus. And I went, there's just a whole bunch of these. Yep. That Parasaurolophus is just one. And it happens to be the one with... Possibly the weirdest version of the head crest. Well, and I, in my opinion, my humble opinion, <laughs> the coolest looking one. It this is very awesome cool. Swept back like speed. <laughs> it, yeah. Oh, well, it's got a bit of the xenomorph yes, with the head protruding farther back beyond the neck. Oh man! Now, now that you mention it that way, I wouldn't be surprised. Is that part of the reason I fell into fell in love with aliens so much as a kid? Could be. <laughs> I was collecting alien toys before I ever saw the films. I, Parasaurolophus is more than a little bit xenomorph shaped. Yeah, it is. <laughs> like just just a bit. Yep. It would give it some sharp teeth and cover it in goo. Well, and you had the the old Jurassic Park toys had a line of monster ones. Where the concept was, it was genetic combinations. So this was the idea that Jurassic World introduced, but way before they ever did that. So they took their idea from a toy line. Sure. Uh, <laughs> is effectively what historically happened. Uh, and they had a whole bunch where it was uh, just mixture, but they had one that was just a predatory <laughs> Parasaurolophus. Weird. <laughs> and it was all like technicolored. They, they, they made them weird colors to indicate that they were mutated amalgamations mm -hmm. uh and it was this aggressive angry parasaurolophus and i remember being kind of like that's weird but i like it <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, parasaurolophus and other hadrosaurs on the note of them using their resonating chambers for sound communication 
very cool for all sorts of reasons. You know, one that just that dinosaurs were noisy animals, which is something we've talked about in relation to crocs and birds, you know, their other relatives. But also hearkening back to a conversation we had recently in another patron uh, mini episode (laughs) talking about big animals using big sounds to communicate and how elephants can use their noisy infrasound to communicate over miles, and how whales can use their songs to communicate just apparently however far they want. Yep. Just thousands of miles across ocean. The thought that herds of giant dinosaurs were doing the same thing and not... Because when I was a kid, I would hear that, and they'd be like, yeah, they would make noises and they'd communicate over uh, with others. In my head, I would always picture like, all right, yeah, you're in a field. Yeah. And one of you is at one end of the field. Uh, Yeah. And you're just (laughs) shouting to each other. You're just communicating. But with things like elephants and whales as the sort of comparison here, these could have been communicating with other parasaurolophuses miles away. Yeah, yeah. On the other side of, yeah, on the (laughs) other side of the forest. Uh, You can hear me over there. We're coordinating our movements. That's a really cool thing to think about. Well, it also, and and there is evidence. I remember when we did bioacoustics, I found a study of the inner ear of Mm Parasaurolophus indicating that it would have had acute hearing. They, they found it down to the, the like, hertz. The hertz, yeah, yeah. But I don't remember if it was high frequency or low frequency. Uh, mm-hmm. I think it was low frequency. I think so. I think it was low frequency. Indicating that they would have been able to do long-distance communication because low frequencies travel faster through air because it is stronger than high frequency, which dissipates quicker. Mm-hmm. So they would have been able to do the elephant thing of communicating for long, long distances, very likely at frequencies we wouldn't be able to perceive adequately. Yeah, and I and I do wonder. It is often true that animals will, when they're communicating with sound, will focus on a sound frequency that no one else is using. Yeah, exactly. Uh, just like a radio. Yes, you, you don't know, want get, to have the mixed signals. Yes, you don't want to get it all mixed up. I also wonder if there is a benefit to using an uncommon frequency because if you're shouting your position across your whole he- ecosystem. <laughs> also, predators are yeah. going to hear that. You don't want the theropods listening in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they're, they're cracking the code yep. <laughs> <laughs> with their with their deciphers. Sir, I've got a signal. <laughs> <laughs> they're going to the watering hole. <laughs> so, like, is that a reason? Would that have not worked for smaller animals or animals that didn't live in herds? Mm-hmm. Like, if you're a solitary group of animals, could you not do? Th- that sort of loud long distance communication because you're just going to get eaten. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Absolutely. Elephants and whales are my two comparisons are both group animals. They're big and social. Huge and social. So they need to communicate and they're big enough to fight off a yes. lot of what would want to mess with them. And they have and they live in groups. Mm-hmm. You're not going to find it, oftentimes an elephant by itself shouting communication out into the forest, I would imagine. I, I with uh, I guess with the ones where the males go off on their own. That's true. Uh, and they definitely, I think, do that to find groups when it comes mating time. Right, right, right. Uh, then again, they're also a big male yeah. elephant. And at that point, no in one... rut. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A big, <laughs> a big determined, a big male elephant wants a place to be. With priorities. <laughs> so, yeah, I wouldn't think anyone wants to mess with that elephant. Well, and the other thing that always comes to mind for me is... The idea of long distance communication makes perfect sense. And of course, you know, I wonder what kind of noise was it making? My brain always goes to elk bugles of just this <gasps> very oh yeah, almost wind instrument weird sound. Well, I love the thought of the elk bugle because whale song is beautiful. Mhm. And elephant calls are like low and rumbly and ominous but an elk bugle is terrifying it's haunting <laughs> it's haunting and terrible yep i love the thought that it would just be a chorus of awful noises yep. well especially at that size <laughs> yeah. like would it just be like a weird organic foghorn that mm. you would just hear this <laughs> like and just this sustained note or something like how weird would it be yeah. but also how much control did when they're not communicating long distance and they're with each other was it like a wind instrument and they're just like yeah. <laughs> yeah like are they making 
really could they make a bunch of different yeah. or was it chirps and whistles and all sorts of things? Yeah. Could, was it just for long? Was yes. it like I can only go loud? Yeah. This is a kazoo. <laughs> yeah. Otherwise, I ha- I just go. Rum, 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 yeah. Yep, exactly. And, and grunt a bunch. This makes one note and it is for one thing. Well, and also thinking about the noises that animals make. So often I will listen to like the noises that various animals make to communicate with each other. And they're always a little bit weird. Yep. Like they're often a little too long or the pitch is a little bit like I often find them unpleasant. They're not musical. They're 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 jarring, which makes sense both a because it's not human. Like I'm not the target audience for this noise. Absolutely. But also that's the point is for a loud sound if you're using it for communication to be noticeable and, and to be recognizable. Distinct. Distinctive. So what what sort of bizarre noises might these big animals have been making that either we would find super weird or that we can't even consider mm-hmm. because they were able to make noises that nothing today is able? Were you able to make to you to hit multiple pitches at the same time? Yeah, yeah. Were you hit? Were you harmonizing with yourself? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> like the throat singing. Exactly. Uh, they'll have multiple <laughs> pit, uh, uh, notes. And like, you know, also that with the various hadrosaurs with very distinct crests that also seem like they were resonating chambers that are hollow with many complicated spaces inside that you would have had a bunch of these different sounds. Yes. Communicating over long, like all sorts of ways. Well, you could have had, I, I'm thinking like bird watchers mm-hmm, or mm-hmm. frog herpers who will go out and just be like, oh, that's a that's a sparrow and that's mm-hmm. a tree frog. You know, I you know the species yes. by the sound they make. How wonderfully easy would it be to do a population, to do a survey of an area where hadrosaur dinosaurs live and just stand outside one day during mating season and get a record of every species within 20 miles? Yep. I was just hearing their bugling from across the landscape. Yep. <laughs> it's really interesting. Also, I've heard I heard one story. I think this was in a National Geographic article of people. And I don't remember if they were just recording audios or whatnot, but they were in uh, the Amazon uh, in, in the rainforest and were noting the different calls that you would hear, but also that there was a schedule that Ooh. the animals would call at different times so as not to overlap with one another. Yeah. And, you know, that naturally they would niche partition the hours of the day. Yeah, not that, just partitioning the frequency, mm-hmm. but the timing. Yes, and also that you would hear different types of calls at different times of day because hot air and cold air yes. transmit sound differently. Yep. So if your call is higher pitch, it will travel better at a particular temperature of day. And that it was really regular that they're like there's the three o'clock the three o'clock frog call that like how well, so you know what time it is exactly you set your watch yeah. by the calls in the forest exactly so would you have hadrosaurs throughout the day and be like oh it's got to be getting near noon corythosaurus is yeah <laughs> or combining ideas to be like all right the lambiosaurs are dying down put these earplugs in yes yep yep because we know who's coming next yes, yep. <laughs> and you don't want to be here like that scene from andor yes yep <laughs> <laughs> yep uh, and this is not even getting into the thing that parasaurolophus has that hadrosaurs generally have of just massive herding mm-hmm. animals of uh, just this idea of like a herd of wildebeest, but just dozens and dozens of 30 foot long, noisy, stompy, you know, they kind of have hadrosaurs often have those sort of hoof shaped mm-hmm. feet. Just these, these herds that would have looked and acted utterly unlike that we- weird combination of familiarity and just being very bizarre. Yes, it is. It, it It's <laughs> for how famous they are. They're very alien like. And that often happened with dinosaurs, especially where the one that becomes famous will often be the weird one. Mm-hmm. Like T-Rex is the most famous of the theropod dinosaurs. And it's a bizarre theropod. Yes. Even among tyrannosaurs, it's the exceptional one. And it's not even like it became famous because it's the weird one. Yeah. It was just the first one. Mm-hmm. It was just the first one we got to understand really well, especially among Tyrannosaurs. Stegosaurus and Ankylosaurus. Like, 
Yeah, Parasaurolophus. Just hap we happened to find one of the super weird ones and it became very well known. Also, as a kid, I didn't know that there were different shapes to the yeah. head. That there's like you you have the famous long, slightly like slowly curving mm -hmm. one that most of the toys use. But there was also one that was like a banana, well, like really tightly curved and shorter. And I think currently those are considered multiple species because yes. there are multiple species of Parasaurolophus, which, which I is, also didn't know. As also, a kid. as a kid, <laughs> yeah, no Parasaurolophus, that's an animal. Yeah. Uh, and I know it's been proposed at some points that the different head crest shapes might be sexual dimorphism. Yeah, male and female. Uh, but I believe the most current research suggests that those are just different species. Yes, I think that's what I found when I'm doing bioacoustics as well, that yeah. those, there's two different species with very distinct shaped crests. Which, uh, on the one hand, is something we see often where, yeah, yeah you, you want your display feature to look different. But also, this is a resonating chamber, so you know that means that the sounds yeah. they made were different. What did you? Was it like we have a trombone and an oboe? Yeah. <laughs> like, were there <laughs> Parasaurolophus barbershop quartets, <laughs> just each with a different shaped head crest, <laughs> doing various harmonies um, with their red and white striped outfits? Now I want a little hats. Now I want someone to do a, a, a drawing of a dinosaur orchestra. And the Hadra stores are the winds. <laughs> the, they're all the brass in the wind section. <laughs> oh, man, they would be. And you have the different different species for you the different have, instruments. You could have, like, ankylosaurs as the percussion yep, yep, section. Yep. <laughs> oh, man. That'd be a lot of fun. I would love, it would be, uh, we've talked before about how it would be a super cool thing to be able to do to sit down with experts from other fields and talk about some of these topics it would be awesome to sit down with a music expert mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and talk about the potential of sounds in a dinosaur like Parasaurolophus. Yes. It's like, what what does this make you think of as someone who actually does like orchestral music mm -hmm. or, you know, composes music or something? Well, I had that thought the other day where I realized I don't know how you tune brass instruments because like right with a guitar you tighten the strings and whatnot same with a piano and yeah. but then like but this is a tube and i don't right i don't i looked it up and it has sliding parts to it that you can adjust oh, yeah, while yeah. playing to to uh, get uh, it in tune but also to reach different notes yeah yeah you're adjusting the path mm -hmm. of the wind the length of the path, the path the air goes makes sense, which is absolutely what I was assuming you would have, because that's how a trombone works. That's when you move your mm -hmm. hand in and out. And if this crest is, since it is bony, mm -hmm. it can't be changing its shape. But you, I don't know if there are like valves. Yeah, because you have valves in there yeah. that close off different parts mm -hmm. to adjust the wind. Like, can you have a loop? But I can, you know, it has two openings in it, so I can make it a long loop or a short loop depending on. Right. where I open and close valves. And yeah, I right. don't know the internal structure enough. There might be someone out there who researches and is like, no, absolutely not. Right. Uh, but even <laughs> then, if you just have a single shaped instrument, how many sounds can you get out of that? I would love to ask a musician. Is this a kazoo? Yeah. Or is this more like a trombone or mm -hmm. a trumpet or something where you can mess with the different... Like, what can you... If you are... If I give you just a lead pipe. <laughs> you know. How many sounds can you make exactly, with this? Exactly, <laughs> yeah. And I and the answer I know is a bunch by the shape of your lips and like how oh, yeah. hard you blow the air well, through and how fast. I've played with a lead pipe mm -hmm. or something similar, <laughs> and I've been able to make a bunch of different noises, and I don't know anything about music. So like, <laughs> how how talented could Parasaurolophus be? <laughs> yes. How many awards? Yes. Could, could Parasaurolophus get an EGOT? And you know that it, it has to be a bunch just because they're communicating. Yeah. And One communications in animals are almost always more complex than they, they first seem to us humans. Yeah. Oh. Very cool animals. Just very cool dinosaurs. They're, they're neat. And a very great suggestion. Thank you so much, Christoph. Thank you for this suggestion. Thank you for your support. Thank you for being a uh, follower of us and a listener of our podcast and a supporter of us on the Patreon. We hope that you've enjoyed this discussion about Parasaurolophus, and we are sure to discuss it more uh, on the podcast in the future. Oh, yeah. One imagines. Keep listening until then. Yeah. Bye. Bye.
Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.